Here we've got the new Panasonic S52X, which beyond having a new blackout paint job, also carries with it a few upgrades, like new recording modes, external USB recording, and live streaming functionality. I also have the new Blackmagic RAW upgrade working, so naturally I tested all these new features and even some third-party accessories, and here's my report. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald and Dunn, and I am definitely back on the cheeseburgers. So for disclosure, Panasonic lent me this camera to make this review. No money changed hands, and they don't get any input on this video's production or get to preview it before it's posted. Also, a bunch of the accessories I mentioned in this video were provided to me for free. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, I do have an ongoing business relationship with Condor Blue. But I'm still going to strive to give you my honest opinions on the usefulness of the various accoutrements. This video does have an actual sponsor though, and that's Storyblocks. So let's break this video up into three sections, the new recording modes, the Blackmagic RAW, and finally the live streaming functionality. So for the new recording modes, we now have several new all intro options, which I can show you in the menu here. We can see here for each cluster of resolution and frame rate combinations, there is now an all intro option available. And these are marked by the letter I, as you can see, normally it says 10-L for long GOP, but 10-I for all intro, which has a higher bit rate. And this continues all the way through up until we hit the 4K and you get into 48P and beyond, you'll see that there's not only just an all intra option, there's actually two all intra options, lower bit rate all intra and then higher bit rate all intra. The difference is 600 megabits per second and 800 megabits per second. The recordable slot indicates that you can record to both the SD cards and the SSD, but the high bit rate 800 megabit per second version can only be recorded to the SSD. Then if we continue on past the cinema 4K, which also has the high and low bit rate all intras, and same with the 3.3K, which have them. If we move into the 6K options, the 5.9K and 6K, there is only long GOP for this style of recording. However, you can still record an all intra, you know, intra frame codec with the 5.9K, but you have to switch to ProRes, which is new on the S52X. First, we'll see that we can record the full HD ProRes options both to the SD card and the SSD. But once we move into the 4K options, it's all SSD. And all the 4K options are 17 by nine. Then we have the 3.3K 4x3. And then we get into the 6K options, which are actually 5.8K 17 by nine. But these are available in ProRes 4-2 or 4-2 HQ. And they are an intra frame option, obviously, with the highest one being the 5.8K 30P 4-2 HQ requiring 1.9 gigabits per second. Hey, Editor Drilled here. So when I was recording some of the menu screens for the edit of this video, I noticed that one of the autofocus quirks from the S5 Mark II, which was the one where if you were in the 6K modes, 5.9K or 6K open gate, and you had HDMI connected, that you would lose your subject detection, like face and eye or human or whatever, which I said would pose a problem for people that wanted to take advantage of the 6K open gate for content creation, but also use a monitor that they would have worse autofocus performance. While I'm noticing that on this camera, the S52X, that is not a thing anymore. You can use the 6K open gate, the 5.9K, and even the 5.8K ProRes, which is where I first noticed this, with and, and maintain the face and eye detection with the monitor connected. So that's fantastic. And it also does that now in the 1080p modes above 60 frames per second, which I'm not 100%, but I think was also an issue on the S52, does not appear to be an issue here anymore. Further testing is required, and I'm hoping that knowing Panasonic that this will also be updated on the S52 when it gets its sort of matching firmware update for the features that can carry over to the S52. But that's a great upgrade, it's a really important improvement on this camera. But now that I have this option to record ProRes on this camera, if you remember my S52 video, there was a conversation about dynamic range and how if you record in 6K, it automatically defaults to an H265 compression, but if you record in 4K, it's H.264. And sometimes when it comes to noise performance, H.265 is better. So I wasn't sure if the scores that we were getting in 6K were actually comparable to the scores in 4K because they were using two different compressions, one that notoriously has better noise performance. So for a refresher, here is the 4K H.264. This is 4K on a 4K timeline. And you can see under slope based DR, it says 14.2. That's the total amount of dynamic range stops that we detected on this sensor, whether it's this camera or the S52. And then we also like to look at the medium score, which is if you have acceptable noise, sort of as a, a signal noise ratio of two, 
then we have a 12.3 score. And that was what we were getting on the S5 II as well. Well, now we can use ProRes as the great equalizer here. So here we have the Cinema 4K ProRes HQ. And again, 14.4 stops and a medium score of 12. So slightly worse in ProRes than in the H.264, H.265, again, because they tend to sort of improve noise a little bit more than ProRes. Now let's switch over to the 5.8K ProRes on a 6K timeline. So no oversampling. The noise reduction on all these clips is set to the minimum in camera. Again, I love that they let you do that on these Panasonic cameras. So now we're gonna see what should be the lowest score possible outside of maybe doing something in RAW, which is 14.2 stops total, 11.9, that's still pretty much 12. So it seems like no matter what you do in this camera, you're gonna get at least 12 clean stops, which is great. Uh, because again, no noise reduction or anything is even applied. So you can only go up from here. And this is the 5.8K. But interestingly is even if we do the 5.8K on a 4K timeline, which is sort of oversampling in post, we're still 14.2 stops and 12 medium. So it wasn't any kind of gimmick on the original S5 II that we were able to achieve that 12 stops. It, it just, it's just 12 stops and the ProRes kind of confirms that. So that's a great result. I just wanted to update you on, on the S5 II results and also here that you're gonna get at least 12 stops no matter what you do and then you can just improve it from there, which is great. Now let's talk a little bit more about that external SSD recording for when you wanna record those big ProRes files on this camera. So here I have the Condor Blue top handle, which is pretty sweet. We we're talking about this at NAB and in my NAB video, but if you've never seen it or know anything about it, basically it's just the silver part here. By the way, shout out to Condor Blue for sending over this cage for the S5 2X. It looks great. I've got the all black one here because it kind of matches the blackout. But uh, obviously you can get the handle in other colors too. I just wanted to show you this one in silver so it stands out. Uh, but basically this is a, a top handle that you can actually also use as a side handle because it just attaches with NATO rails. And this cage has NATO rails on the side so you could use it as a side handle if you wanted. But inside the handle is a SanDisk Professional Pro Blade. Now these are new NVMe, they're NVMe storage in sort of a custom little caddy that you can slide in, you know, a receptacle that receives it, like this handle, or I'll show you their SanDisk sort of whole ecosystem in a minute. But basically, in this case, it goes in the handle, and the handle communicates via USB-C into the USB port on the camera, and then that allows you to access those, you know, 1.9 gigabit per second files recorded externally. And then in the menu of the camera, you just go in and you turn USB SSD to on, and then it initializes that. Now, one note is that you cannot record to the USB SSD and the SD cards at the same time. It's one or the other. You can record a clean feed over HDMI at the same time as recording to the SSD. So that is an option for redundancy. Not HDMI RAW though, just if you wanted to record DNX or ProRes externally on your Ninja or your Video Assist or whatever, you know, you can do that 4K, up to 4K 60 probably, on this and the SSD simultaneously. But now let's talk a little bit more about this whole SanDisk professional Pro Blade ecosystem thing. So, well, first off, you can use other SSDs, just USB-C SSDs. I can't guarantee which ones will work or don't work. I haven't tested them all. I have tested the Samsung T5 though, which is obviously a pretty common one. And I can say that one works directly on this camera. If you just plug your T5 in and I was able to get all the way up to the 1.9 gigabits per second and other drives may work as well. Your mileage may vary. No guarantees. I don't know if there's a database of this yet. Maybe the users will have to build that of which drives work, but these Pro Blades are pretty sweet and I wanna tell you a little bit about them. So if you don't want to use the Condor Blue top handle, maybe you don't wanna rig your cameras, maybe you got a different system in mind, then SanDisk also makes these, which are the, the Pro Blade transports, which are basically an interface with your computer for you know, USB-C and that's sort of a dock, if you will, for the drive but it also is rugged and keeps it safe and helps with heat dissipation because these NVMe drives can get quite hot. Now the handle itself from Condor Blue could actually come off, you could take it off the NATO rail and then just plug the USB port in your computer and the handle can also sort of be a transport, if you will, for these Pro Blades, which is kind of sweet if you only want to buy the handle and you don't mind taking it off and plugging it in your computer, that can work. Or even if you use a longer USB cable, I guess, you could just plug your rig directly into your computer. You could edit off your rig if you wanted to. But these transports could also be plugged directly into the camera if you wanted to, similar to a T5, but then you'd have the ability to swap out the internal drive, so that's cool. But basically, I'd say the transport's best thing is if you're you know, editing mobile or whatever, you have your rig, you shoot, you take out the Pro Blade, stick it in here, put this in your bag, now you know you've got the drive and it's safe, then you just plug this in your laptop and you edit and you get on your way. 
However, something that's even cooler with the SanDisk Professional stuff, which they sent over, is I'm thinking ahead, I'm thinking, what if you had multiple cameras and multiple, and they were all recording to multiple Pro Blades and you've got like three or four of these things, it's not going to be efficient to hook up multiple handles to your computer, it's not going to be efficient to have four of these dangling off. So, they have something called the Pro Blade Station, which I've actually got it right here. It is this sweet little, fairly compact for what it is, four bay Pro Blade dock that on the back takes, uh, it's all USB-C. It takes a 100 watt USB-C power delivery and it comes in the box with, uh, with a power brick and a cord for that. And then also Thunderbolt, 40 gigabit per second. So you can get like 10 gigs on each drive if you wanted to, or I guess higher on a single drive. And this has me excited about some potential for even shooting in the studio here. It's like, what if I had, you know, three or four of these bad boys as all the cameras and just recording all these Pro Blades. Okay, now let's talk about Blackmagic RAW and I want to show you something even cooler that this sort of convertible rig can do. So generally when you record Blackmagic RAW, you record it to the video assist. And in doing that, there is an SD card slot on the side and I tested it and it works fine. I was even able to record the constant quality Q0 Blackmagic RAW directly to the SD card. The only issue is you get no time. Like this 64 gig card in here, now that I've recorded a little bit on, I think, I think it started with like eight minutes or 11 minutes. And I've got three minutes left in just doing these tests here. So that's not viable for storage. You have to put a massive SD card in there and those are expensive. But you know, it's cheaper than an SD card, an SSD. And if you already have your rig set up like this, all you have to do is unplug the USB drive from the side of your camera, which is the one that's going in this case to the Pro Blade, and then plug it in to the bottom of the video assist where there is a USB-C port. Now I can no longer record my screen, but if we go to the record quality, we only have a few options here and they are uh, 5.9K, 4.1K, and 3.5K. The 3.5K is a four by three aspect ratio. The 4.1K is a 17 by nine aspect ratio, APS-C, and it goes up to 60 frames per second. And then the 5.9K is a 16 by nine, and it only goes up to 30P. And how sweet is it that you can just take the USB cord from the camera, switch it back in this particular setup. I can pretty much do everything this camera wants to do. I can record, you know, ProRes internally to the external SSD. I can record Blackmagic RAW externally to the recorder, then back through the SSD. I can record to the SD card over here. I can record low, long GOP stuff, the SD cards in the camera. And all I have to do is switch a cable back and forth. It's, it's pretty wild. I gotta be honest with you, it's pretty wild. But anyway, let's talk about the actual results of Blackmagic RAW because that's the more important part than where can you plug your cables in. Oh, and keep in mind that most of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today is not available on the S5 II, but this part is. Blackmagic RAW and ProRes RAW if you buy the little upgrade code, you can unlock your S5 II to be able to do the Blackmagic RAW. And that would include recording to this handle if you wanted to. You just couldn't record the handle from the camera, but you could still build this rig on your S5 II and just use the handle plugged into your video assist. You could still do that because it's still a pretty sweet handle and a nice elegant way to hide the drive. Okay, first up, let's talk about the RAW development panel here in DaVinci Resolve for Blackmagic RAW because I'm really impressed with how flushed out it is for this particular one. In the past, you know, when I would make an update video like this, it would be like, well, it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that, and you can only decode to this, and I wish it had that. This one has it all, and everything works intuitively, and it's great. So, first of all, let's go in and we'll set it to clip so we can change the things. So, color science is an option between Gen 5 and Gen 4 that really only takes effect if you choose like a Blackmagic Gamma. So, see here, we have the option between Vlog. If we chose Blackmagic Design Film, it'll change back. But if we, if we put this back to Vlog, which is the default, Changing to Gen 4, Gen 5 doesn't do anything because it doesn't apply. We also have the option for highlight recovery, which is interesting and we'll talk about it in a second. But why don't we take a pause here and I'll tell you about the actual dynamic range score on the B-RAW because that's important, obviously. So let me pull up those results. Okay, here we go. We got 5.9K B-RAW in V-Log on a 4K timeline. And you can see we're getting the same results that we got internally. A 14.4 total stop seen with a 12.2 signal is ratio of two with a clean, like clean 12.2 stops, which is great. And if we do it on a 6K timeline, so without that extra oversampling boost, we still get pretty much the same, 14.2, 12.2. So B-RAW also confirms that the oversampling aspect isn't important on this camera, that you can get the same result, whether you put on a 4K timeline or 6K timeline, which is great. Uh, but also these results are great that they match the dynamic range internally. There's nothing weird going on. There's not an excessive amount of noise. If we look at the image itself here, 
in DaVinci Resolve, you can see it's a pretty clean image. Now this here shows if you enabled highlight recovery. Now highlight recovery kind of breaks Imatest the way that it's supposed to analyze the it analyzes Xyla 21 because it's it's expecting to have certain things clipped. So when you unclip them, it kind of kind of breaks a little bit, but it does give us an idea of how much maybe you can expect to recover with highlight recovery. So we turn highlight recovery on on Vlog and we just run the test again. We can now see a total of 15.1 stops. So we get almost a full stop extra. And that makes the amount of clean stops 13, which again, so we're, we're getting about 0 0.8, 0 0.8 extra stops between on highlight recovery. Again, this test, take it with a grain of salt because it's not really meant to evaluate highlight recovery but maybe we can use it as sort of a marker that we get maybe another 0.8 stops with highlight recovery. And the highlight recovery works well. If you, again, look at the Zy21 and I turn it on and off, it's easier to see if you look over here in the waveform on off, you can see it's rebuilding those stops there. So that, that's great. So far, everything is great. But like I said, we can decode to other gammas. And this is one of the most exhaustive catalogs I've seen. I hope that moving forward, other cameras are gonna get this great of a gamma option for decoding. So we've got the different Blackmagic design ones, including Gen 4 and Gen 5, as we talked about. We can decode to linear, which is good if you want to use, you know, a CST or something. We've got our, our rec options here. And then we also have ACES. We have V-Log, Canon Log 2, RE Log C3, and RE Log C4. N-Log for Nikon. Uh, and L-Log, which is the Leica one, I'm pretty sure. So naturally, I decoded to each one of these and kind of did a roundup of like, which one gives us the best results? Which log is best? And <laughs> this is where we get pretty nerdy here. Uh, RE log C3, 14.4 with a 12.2. So that's pretty similar to V log. RE log C4, 14 with a 12.1. Again, pretty similar. Uh, Black Magic Design Gen 4, we get 14.9 total stops with a 12.1. It can see a little bit more into the shadows, it seems. Might require a bit more cleanup. Black Magic Design Gen 5, 15.1 with 11.9. Canon log 2. 15.1 total stops, 11.9 clean. L-log, 14.9, 12.1. You can see they're all very similar. And then N-log, which it did better than I expected, 14.6 and 12. I thought this was gonna be worse, but I'm thinking that maybe that just might be the original manufacturer, LUT, was not doing any favors to N-log because the result is pretty good here. Basically, what this is telling us is that it doesn't really matter. You could you could convert to whatever gamma you like to work with, I suppose. If you have a LUT they really like, maybe you really like working with log C or you like Canon log 2, you're not giving much up or gaining much either way, really. So convert to whichever one you prefer. If you like working in Vlog, great. That's the, the one that it does automatically. Okay, now let's talk about the white balance correction because I've seen some other implementations of Blackmagic Raw where the white balance adjustment kind of worked, but it still, it, it wasn't perfect. It didn't, it wasn't like transparent. You had to then go in and tweak the colors individually. These are all decoded to Vlog and they have their original color temperature. So let's look, we've got our 5323. We've got our 3183. I said this one at 3200. Uh, this one's set to, I think, 7,000, it showed up as 6,100, and this one was set to 10,000, it showed up as 8,000. Set to 10,000 in camera, and it's reading it as 8,000. What we're gonna do though is we're gonna set them all back to 5,500. So go in 5,500, go to the 6,000 one, 5,500. This one that was 3,200. Again, and we'll even, we'll just set the default one to exactly 5,500. Oh, and we also gotta set their tints back. Uh, now if I flick through them real quick, look. You can hardly see anything change. And if we look at the vector scope as kind of proof as I flick through them, there's very tiny shifts, but they're so minor. This is an excellent implementation of raw changing white balance. Let's move on to exposure adjustments. We've got three shots. And as I flick back and forth, let's look at the waveform on these actually. So as I flick back and forth, the waveform almost looks identical. They were shot completely different. So you look at this one, it says exposure one. If I reset that, I reset this one. These are the neutral exposures. So you've got correct, you've got one stop over and one stop under. And the way you do the exposure corrections is completely logical. You just go to exposure and you just type in one, it boosts it by a stop. For this one, minus one, it lowers it by a stop and it completely matches. It's not ISO, but it matches the ISO in camera. So if you raise it by one stop in ISO in camera, then you come in here and you lower it one stop, It the image matches. Oh, and lastly, I didn't mention it, but there's matching color spaces for each one of those gammas as well. So, you know, V gamut for V-log, but we also have Canon Cinema gamut. We've got both the RE wide gamut 3 and 4. We've got DaVinci wide gamut. Basically, every combination that you would be able to do in those cameras, you can do here as well, which is great. And overall, this implementation of Blackmagic Raw is probably the best I've seen, and it's probably the best third-party recording implementation I've ever seen as well. In, ahead of ProRes RAW, ahead of any other Blackmagic RAW, this is the this is the most 
the easiest, most intuitive, just sort of best I've seen. And it might be the best way to record on the S5 II or S5 IIx because of the slight advantages, the, the highlight recovery, the extra dynamic range, uh, the optimized codec, the way you can record different, like multiple recording options. Actually, there is one more caveat that I need to mention, even though it's just a carryover from the S5 II, which is that HDMI latency is still an issue on this camera. So if you do plan on recording raw or external or even just monitoring, you got to keep that in mind is that by default, if you, you know, move the camera around, what you see on the screen is then delayed by like half a second up here, which can be a bit much, you know, if you're like trying to pull focus or something, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, however, if you turn the external sound output off, so basically where the recorder's not getting any sound up here, there's no sound over HDMI, then it becomes usable. I would then put it in the usable category. It's unfortunate that we have to do this, and obviously it would be nice if you could record sound here. Otherwise, you're going to have to record sound externally, which then complicates things. Uh, and it's definitely an issue that needs to be fixed, but turning off audio is a workaround. And theoretically, if you're just recording a static subject, then the latency doesn't really matter either. So just keep that in mind. It is... It is an issue, and they really do need to solve this latency once and for all in these Panasonic cameras, in my opinion. But you know what doesn't have any latency? Stock footage from the sponsor of today's video, Storyblocks. Sometimes you don't have the shot you need, and there's no way you're going to be able to go out and get it before you run out of time, run out of money, or run out of patience by completely derailing your creative momentum. And that's where Storyblocks comes in. Storyblocks is a stock media platform that boasts a massive library of high-quality assets aimed to strengthen your video production. Their subscription model provides predictable costs without any pay-per-clip licensing. Just pick a plan, pay that fee, and that's it. And you'll enjoy unlimited downloads of HD and 4K video files, images, and motion graphics templates that you can use worry-free for both your personal and commercial projects. And the platform is intuitive and easy to use, and new content is added regularly with a focus on in-demand keywords to deliver up-to-date assets to satisfy your project. And if you're an Adobe Creative Cloud user, you can now access the entire Storyblocks library in Premiere Pro or After Effects by installing a clever little plugin, which can really speed up your workflow. If you've never browsed Storyblocks before, I think you'll be truly impressed by just how exhaustive and useful the library is, and I encourage you to learn more about them by using the link in the description below. Now lastly, let's discuss the new live streaming stuff. Let me show you the new menu items first and discuss what they do. Okay, so first off, you go into the streaming menu inside of your camera here, and you've got streaming function you can either turn on or off. And then for streaming method, there's two. There's direct and via PC software. Now direct basically means that the camera is streaming from the camera itself, but there's a couple ways to do this. So if you go into connection method, you've got Wi-Fi or USB tethering. Now the USB tethering option is that you would take a USB cable, plug it from the USB port in the camera to your phone, and then in your phone you would set up some kind of direct internet sharing thing, basically where your phone becomes like a modem attached to your camera. That would be a setting on your phone, and you might have to use, you know, a lightning converter if you're using Apple or whatever it would be, and you would use your phone that way. If you use Wi-Fi, then you have two options. You can see on the screen here, it shows basically a, as a phone or a modem or access point. So same thing, with, with the Wi-Fi to phone option, you use your phone as a hotspot. So you go on your phone, you set it up as a Wi-Fi hotspot, and then the camera would connect to the Wi-Fi on the phone. With this method, though, you can also use the app, the Lumix Sync app, to help you set up the RTMP. This is all RTMP streaming we're talking about. So you would say, go to YouTube, you would get your RTMP stream key, and then you would put that in the camera. And you can get the Lumix Sync app to do that part for you. If you use the other method of Wi-Fi, the access point, then you would need to go down to streaming setup and then choose the Wi-Fi connection setting and choose new connection, and then choose from list, find the SSID for the Wi-Fi wherever you are, connect to it, and then now the camera itself is on Wi-Fi. You don't need your phone at all, and the camera is going to make the connection to the internet and stream. But in that case, then you're going to have to put in your that same RTMP to like, what's my YouTube channel? You're going to have to put that in here under streaming address, and there's two ways to do this. You can actually, I think, physically type it in using the little, <laughs> little controls on the camera, which could be annoying, or there's an app that you can use. Again, you can use the Sync app, it's probably the easiest way, but there's another app that you can you can get on your computer that saves it to an SD card in a particular format that you can put the SD card in your camera and then pull the code up, or again, you can just type it in. But that would be the way that requires the least amount of devices. You can literally just type the code into your camera, connect your camera to the Wi-Fi, and then stream right from the camera. And you can see the streaming options we have go down to 720, all the way up to 1080p 60 is the top option there. Now, that's all live streaming, and that's all good, but there's another option here you can see where when we have the streaming method set to, instead of direct, if we choose via PC software, 
then the connection method becomes LAN and that's the only option. So that requires one of these, which is a USB-C to Ethernet, like RJ45 dongle basically. And then you would plug that in to the USB port. And for streaming setup, we actually have more options now. You can see instead of just the full HD, this is now using RTSP instead of RTMP. So you can see there's an RTSP port. And so we turn streaming function on now on the camera. And then now over an OBS, I'm gonna start recording an OBS so that you can see what I'm doing here. We can go in and we can add a media source, which uh, you just go to plus and you choose a media source here. And I already have that one added. So I'm gonna go in and I'm just gonna adjust the settings of it. And then you put in the RTSP address, your IP address, which you can actually find in the camera. You go into the menu, then you choose LAN slash Wi-Fi, LAN Wi-Fi setup, come down here to uh, network address display LAN, and that shows you your IP address. In my case, it's 192.168.2.224. And then again, over here in OBS, we put colon 554 because that's the RTSP port. You can change the port, and then you would change it here as well, slash stream. So you put all that in there, and then now you would have seen a blue box appear around the frame here. I think that's probably being captured, hopefully, by the info display or not. And then we see our image up here on the screen. And there is a bit of latency, so this is the issue with RTSP. Um, I'm gonna move the camera and then you can see the delay there. So if I move it, I mean, that's like two thirds of a second there. It ain't great. So latency is not your friend when it comes to RTSP, but this is an option. And if you wanted to like further extend this, I don't know, this might not be very useful. Something that this camera doesn't have that I wish it did is I wish the USB port did what the Sony cameras could do as like another option, which is that UVC, it's a video over USB simplified auto detected webcam kind of thing. If you take your Sony a7 IV and you plug the USB in, plug it in your computer, it goes, ah, it's a webcam and it just uses it super easy. But what you could do is an OBS, let's just make the source smaller so we can see both at the same time. I'll put it here. Okay, this will work. So now you get to see my OBS, what I'm doing and the source as well. So now if I click start virtual camera, what it's gonna do is take everything that OBS sees and turn that into a webcam. So then, which, and normally you would have this source full screen, so it'd be your full camera would be your webcam, but I'm trying to also show you what I'm doing. So then if I go and I start a Google Meet for the camera, we would choose OBS virtual camera. You can see now we actually have a, this has become a webcam and we're using it on Google Meet. And what's interesting about it too is that it's actually, it's in sync, even though it has significant latency on it. If I were to snap my fingers, the thing that gets sent through the call, the sound and the video do line up. It just happens later than I would have intended. Again, like, you know, two thirds of a second later. So it would almost be more like those, those newscasts where somebody like asks you a question and then there's just like a slight delay before you start responding. It's small though, it's less than a second, but it is still there. That's the only thing that you would experience if you use as a webcam. But it's still an option. Like if you needed to make this camera, you know, kind of work for everything all at once, then you have that ability, it'll work. So that's, it, it's kind of cool, I, I, gotta, I gotta admit. Okay, now the last thing I wanna show you, which isn't really about live streaming, but it's while using this, you know, USB-C to Ethernet adapter and having it run over your network tethered like that, there's another option you can do. It's not live streaming though. So you go in, and this time we're gonna turn the streaming off because we're not actually gonna use the streaming part of this, even though we're still using the Ethernet adapter. We're gonna go down to USB and then choose tether USB Ethernet adapter and turn that on. Then on the computer, we open up an app called Lumix Tether. And then this is what we see. We see the feed from the camera, but now we have a whole bunch of camera controls. And you can do multiple cameras controlled this way as well. I can change this to, you know, f2.8 on this lens, and then it immediately updated over here, as you can see. And you got lots of control, you know, you got white balance, you got basically everything you can see on the screen, you can change on the camera. And you can also start recording and stop recording. And it even says that I'm connected over HDMI. So if I press record here, then yeah, it started recording and it's, it's just cool. You can stop it like that. Anyway, that's it for now. I've really been enjoying playing around with these new functions. This camera is impressively versatile and probably possesses the most complete set of capabilities I've seen in a long time, especially when considering the price point. This is a slam dunk from Panasonic and I'm very excited to see what they make next. All right, I'm done.